It's now my great pleasure to introduce our guest this evening, uh, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction for The Emperor of All Maladies, a meticulously researched and panoramic history of humankind's fight against cancer. It was named to numerous media outlets' best of year lists and was adapted by Ken Burns into a PBS documentary. Dr. Mukherjee is also the author of a number one New York Times bestseller, The Gene, An Intimate History. After after completing secondary school in India, uh, he earned his undergraduate degree in biology at Stanford and then attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, after which he attended Harvard Medical School. Currently, Dr. Mukherjee is Associate Professor of Medicine at Columbia University, uh, a cancer physician at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, and a researcher whose laboratory focuses on discovering new cancer drugs. His articles and commentary have been published in such places as Nature, New England Journal of Medicine, The New York Times, The New Republic. Uh, in, his, in, uh, in his new book, The Song of the Cell, Dr. Mukherjee tells the story of how scientists discovered cells, began to understand them, and now are using that knowledge to create new humans. Uh, filled with writing so vivid, lucid, and suspenseful that complex science becomes thrilling. This, the Song of the Cell is laced with Muk Dr. Mukherjee's own experience as a researcher, a physician, and a prolific reader. Joining Dr. Mukherjee on stage tonight is a Philadelphia superstar, Dr. Carl June. Dr. June is the Richard W. Vague Professor of Immunology, excuse me, of Immunotherapy in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Music. Music. <laughs> <laughs> Perlman School of Medicine. Uh, I was going there pretty well, but okay. Where, where, he, where he is also uh, the director of the Center for Cellular Immunotherapies uh, and um, involved with the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. He is acclaimed for his research and treatment of leukemia. Dr. June pioneered CAR T therapy, the first FDA approved personalized cellular therapy. He's published more than 500 medical papers and has received numerous awards and honors. Uh, I picked a few that were, I thought were the, among the most interesting. He has the Distinguished Graduate Award from the US Naval Academy. He has the Keio Medical Science Prize from, from Japan and the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. Uh, I know we're all eager to hear what is sure to be an amazing discussion, so please join me in welcoming uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee and Carl June to the stage. Hi, Carl. Well, hello, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's really a great time to be here, you know, with Philadelphia just getting a Nobel Prize for the COVID vaccine. So if you missed that on two Monday. So, you know, Sid, I've been wondering, you know, the main, you know, your book, you know, The Song of the Cell here is such an amazing story, and I hope you all read it, because it puts in a layman's way how you can understand, for instance, the, the mystery of how all of us start with one cell, but how a kangaroo starts with one cell, and yet how are we so different? You know, and it takes it through that, and then how can that lead into cancer and other diseases? So I think it's, it makes it, it un, an understanding the history of how it happened, because there's so many improbable things that said, you know, and, you know, and, and talks about in that, that I think um, it just makes it in a way that you just, it's so delicious to read. So thanks for coming down. Oh, my pleasure. Man. Thank you. Carl and I have known each other. You're even in the book. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 have, you have a cameo appearance. Yeah, so, you know, I think, you know, understanding a cell and what can go wrong is really important. Um, I wonder what you learned most while you were doing that, you know, overview. So, um, what's interesting about it is that um, I think that there were um, sort of three very broad threads that bring this book together. Um, the first thread um, 
actually is the fact that we know very, we knew, or I knew, very little about um, this whole story. Um, it's another, I think, uh, to some extent, like my first book and my second book, um, it's, it's, it was sort of, to, even to me, an untold story. Um, who found the first cell? What did they think about it? How did they figure that piece out? Um, and what happened? What was the what were the events or the series of events that led to the, the discovery and then subsequently the realization that all of us are made out of cells. So, uh, so there was, there's, a, there's a massive historical piece. Um, second, um, there was a um, scientific piece. And the scientific piece is uh, how does all of this work? Um, how does a single cell develop into an, a full-fledged organism? Um, how does any of this um, manifest itself in normalcy? And um, what, is the, what is the nature? How are we built out of all of this? Um, that's a, an, an amazing story. And how do we figure all of that out, starting from the uh, interior anatomy of the cell, the structural anatomy of the cell, to the physiology of the cell? Um, and then the third piece, which of course you're um, very much a part of and very much involved in, and Philadelphia is very much a part of is, um, you know, what happens when things go abnormally um, and how to treat them. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, I wanted to congratulate you also on, on the Breakthrough Prize, but um, that prize is, of course, given because um, it was no fewer than, I don't know, a few miles from here, maybe less than a few miles from mm -hmm. here, where um, uh, the first uh, child with uh, leukemia was treated with uh, T cell, modified T cell therapies, uh, of course, uh, under, under your um, vision. And um, what's uh, astonishing about it, which you know and I know, but maybe the rest of that, this audience doesn't know, was that this young girl, Emily Whitehead, whose picture you can um, see, here, see here, I'll put it up in two seconds, um, was so uh, ill that she was basically given up for dead the first picture among the pictures, um, that's uh, Emily. Um, so she's so sick that she was give, given up for dead, um, brought here in, in, in deep, deep physiological distress. Any, I don't know if many of you have had the misfortune or the, or the opportunity to see a, a, a patient with acute lymphoblastic leukemia in the sort of the, the deadliest stages of the disease. They are so sick um, that it's, um, it's almost as if everything fails all at once. It's a, the, the, the whole system is under collapse. Anyway, that was true, as you very well note for Emily. And um, with the T cells um, and with the other therapies that were appropriately given, and we can come back to that story in a second, um, she came alive and um, then remained alive and is alive. But the most interesting piece of all of this is that she is now a freshman, fresh woman, at the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, so um, this human being would not exist on the planet. Um, and you know, revolutions begin one human being, medical revolutions begin one human being at a time. Other revolutions also begin one human being at a time. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, that it's important to recognize the role that, that you and others have played in this. And, really congratulate um, the whole ecosystem, of course, and then and congratulate Emily um, on, her, and on her journey, and maybe she'll go on to cure um, yet another disease. Maybe, it, maybe it's paying it forward. Yeah, it's, it's been quite a story with her. Um, and, you know, it's, it, because she almost died. I mean, as it said, she was really sick. She had a fever of 106 degrees for three days after we treated her. And I mean, we had no idea why that was. And um, through pure serendipity, we found out that it was the CAR T cells attacking her own bone marrow and the leukemia. And then fighting back, that led to this horrendous fever that wasn't caused by an infection. That, that was a new finding in medicine that you could actually hyperactivate the immune system that way. And, and we now learned that that's, that's actually a good sign. It used to be you know, when you got really sick like that, that was bad. But it now means that that's a sign of response. And, you know, Sid and I grew up in medicine with, 
where high dose chemotherapy and radiation was what was given. And then when you got sick like that, it didn't mean you were getting better. It just meant it was toxic. So we had a whole new thing um, that we're involved in now, which is these new kinds of immunotherapies. That's called an on-target effect, when um, you know, the treatment is actually causing side effects, but it's because you're getting better. And you know, so completely different than chemotherapy, where that doesn't help. So that now, you know, we actually have to tell the patients about the difference between those, and um, they accept that. It's a lot harder to have your hair fall out and vomit from chemotherapy, and it's not helping to get better. So now, I mean, actually, I've seen patients start smiling when they get the fever. <laughs> um, so, and I want to tell you, you know, I think Sid could give you an update. He's made a whole new kind of therapy, but, you know, the other main kind of leukemia, one is B-cell leukemia, and that's, that's what Emily had, but the other is called myeloid leukemia. And Sid has invented a really interesting uh, new generation of therapy for that, and, and maybe you could give us an update. Yeah, so um, uh, that's in my other life. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but in my other life, actually, uh, uh, still think about medicine. Um, but uh, uh, the idea there was, so um, with, with B-cell leukemias, uh, uh, which like the ones that Emily had, um, you get a little bit of an evolutionary trick. Um, and the evolutionary trick is, and very few people know this, it turns out that for reasons that we don't fully understand, don't we understand somewhat, you, human beings can live without B cells. Um, uh, you, we ha may have to give them medicines. B cells make antibodies or are precursors that make antibodies. And you can actually give people antibodies by infusion. Um, so, um, in fact, um, one thing that you might know, it's interesting side, again, a side note, um, is that that's partly the reason that babies um, get their antibodies from their mothers, usually. Um, because there's a passive transfer of antibodies until their own immune systems can get activated and, and start working. Um, so, so you can live without B cells, um, and that's a, that's a peculiarity, evolutionary peculiarity that human beings have. So therefore, when you kill a leukemia, B cell leukemia, you end up typically, uh, at least temporarily, also killing B cells. And that is, by a miraculous chance, compatible with life. Otherwise, someone like Emily you could never treat because you would kill her B-cell leukemia, the malignant or cancerous B-cells, but you'd also end up killing her normal B-cells. And that would be, if, it, if that was incompatible with life, then she, we wouldn't be able to, she wouldn't be able to live. Now, the other kind of leukemia has uh, unfortunately bediv bedeviled us for a very long time and because it, it's not a B-cell leukemia. It's a leukemia of a different part of the blood uh, called myeloid cells. So myeloid leukemias are deadly. Um, they are, people often say, you know, how deadly you know, pancreatic cancer is and so forth. Myeloid leukemia is about as deadly in, in certain genetic forms, about as deadly, if not more deadly, than any other cancer you'd ever encounter. Um, and for the longest time, we didn't know what to do about it, and that was my challenge. I work in the myeloid world, just like Carl works to some extent in the lymphoid world, the B-cell, T-cell world. So um, I um, had this idea, and I'll tell you the, the origin. It's, the origin story is kind of a fun story. I was in Mexico uh, with my daughters, um, and I was making these uh, drawings. Um, and, I, and some of you might have ever made it. The nice thing in Mexico when we go there is that this house is so far away from anywhere is that you don't have any internet. Um, and I would encourage you, if you ever want to have a good idea in life, you should go to a place that has no internet. Uh, because the internet is, is the poison of all good ideas. Um, so anyway, so there I was, sitting there without any internet, feeling very frustrated uh, at first. And so I said, you know, what should I do? I'll, let's, let, I'll sit down with my kids and do doodles or do drawings with them. And we started doing these inverted drawings. So you take a, instead of doing a, uh, white, you know, black pencil on a white uh, sheet, you draw a white pencil on a black sheet and so forth. So just for fun. And then I began to think, God, you know, um, 
while I was doodling along and my daughters were doodling and they were drawing Mickey Mouse cartoons and, um, and birds and the ocean, um, I was drawing pictures of these myeloid cells. <laughs> um, and um, the, the problem with the myeloid cells is that you can't live without them. They're not like B cells. If you kill the myeloid leukemia, you also kill the myeloid cells and then you're stuck. The person is not compatible with life. Um, you can't live without them. They are the cells that form your blood, red blood, they form your platelets, the, the, the stuff that keeps you alive. Um, and I thought, well, wait a second. What if we, so, so all our attention those thus far had been focused on killing the cancer cell, um, the, no, the abnormal malignant myeloid cell. And while I was making these inverted drawings, I said, well, wait a second, what if we did the opposite and instead of focusing first on killing the abnormal or malignant myeloid cell, what if we first made the normal myeloid cells somehow resistant or immune to a certain kind of therapy? So in other words, um, you know, uh, it's almost like saying, think about the world differently. Instead of, um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna pick up some random person in the audience. Instead of uh, focusing our attention on that gentleman over there, who um, uh, we want to get rid of. I'm sorry, we don't really want to get rid of you. Um, uh, but we want to get rid of. Um, what if we made, and so the only, the, all our attention would be, how can we make, how, do, how can we identify that gentleman? He's wearing a blue shirt, I'm sorry. Um, sorry to make an example of you, but um, um, he's wearing a blue shirt. I'll, I can say, I'll say, everyone who's wearing a blue shirt is now going to be targeted. Um, in this audience, okay? Uh, I said, well, what if we do, did the opposite? What if we said, what if we said everyone in this audience stand up in your, sh in your seats and now put a white shirt on, okay? And then all of a sudden, by, just by virtue of doing that, uh, the malignant cell would become uh, visible. Um, and there are genetic ways you can do this. I'm not gonna go into the depths of the technology, but it's an inverted way of looking at the universe. Instead of targeting the cancer cell, you basically convert the bone marrow into an immune environment or a resistance environment. And you can do that. There are complicated genetic mechanisms by which you can do that. And once you do that, all of a sudden the cancer cell stands out like a sore thumb or like this gentleman would, would uh, wearing his, I'm sorry again, but uh, wearing his blue shirt. Um, and so um, that's what we've been done, and we've done this now. It sounds crazy, uh, but we can do this in humans. We've now done this in about 12 humans, and lo and behold, bizarrely enough, you can actually do this in humans. You have all these technologies, a suite of technologies, that allow us to now convert these cells into uh, different kinds of cells, the normal cells, thereby making the cancer stick out like a sore thumb, and now, once it sticks out like a sore thumb, we're deploying the next generation of therapies so that now we can kill the sore thumb, remove the sore thumb, or whatever it might be. So that's a completely new direction, um, and I hope that trial is successful, and that's, it, we, it, there's a, there, there are multiple iterations of it. Um, and one iteration, of course, uses technology that Carl and his colleagues have developed, CAR-Ts again, but this time directed not against B cells, but against myeloid cells. So, Sorry about the very long explanation, but I thought I would paint a vision of, of what happens when you don't have the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll hope for a power outage. But, um, you know, the cell that, that's outlined in this book here, you know, the principles are shown as it, I mean, one cell can turn into two and two to four, and you can do the math. Um, and a CAR T cell begins with one T cell from the patient, which is what happened in Emily, and they, it became literally billions. But the same thing happens when the cell goes rogue and becomes a cancer cell. One cell, two, and it becomes billions, and that's what, what we have as a battle. Um, and we'll come back to how that can happen. But I wanted to ask, you know, since Emily's been treated, there's now been about 20,000 people treated with CAR T cells. and. Um, the real problem has been the cost. Um, and it cost about you know, $400,000 to, you know, from a commercial perspective, to make CAR T cells now. Although the chemotherapy and all that actually costs more if you add it up in patients who get bone marrow transplants. So 
So that's a problem right now is it costs a lot. And I wonder um, if you can talk, Sid, about the efforts you're doing to try to democratize this. Yeah, so another effort, aside from the myeloid leukemia, another effort that I've launched is um, to make these T cells in India. Um, and when, you, when they're made in India, generally speaking, they're made for the rest of the world because um, India is the largest site for um, the manufacture of all generic medicines, typically inexpensive medicines. If you go to Mexico and you are on Herceptin, that Herceptin probably came from India. If you are in Venezuela or South Africa and you get some other medicine, if, again, um, uh, within affordability that probably came from India. So I thought to myself, why don't we try to make uh, T cells um, in India, CAR T cells in India? Um, I'm the master of impractical ideas, by the way. Um, <laughs> if you have an impractical idea, just come to me afterwards. I'm, I'll, I'll take it all in. If, uh, so I'm being the master of impractical ideas. I said, well, let's just try to do it and let's see what happens. And I got, I, I don't know how I roped you in. I got, I roped Carl in um, and said, Carl, listen. And it, and it was mostly a cold call, if I remember correctly. I said, Carl, listen, you know, I really want to make these um, genetically modified T cells in India and offer them for uh, one tenth, maybe even one twentieth the price. Um, and everyone thought it was crazy. Um, and uh, I should tell you that that was four years ago and just last month we treated our 25th patient um, and very successfully. Yep. Um, and uh, we forced Carl to come maybe twice. Yeah. Um, um, and we are now making the, 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 the toughest, there will be very tough steps, by the way, here. Um, you have to create basically a vault, which you made here in, at Penn, uh, one of the best in, its, best in class, best in the world. Um, you have to create a vault where all of this is uh, manufactured, where one single droplet of an, infections, uh, of an infection will completely close down the facility. Um, and it has to be cleaned with a, basically with a toothbrush um, from beginning to end. So that's how clean that facility has to be. Um, and then, a s separate from making that vault um, uh, and training people to get into that vault and operate and you know, they have to wear suits and so forth, Separate from making that, um, you have to make the, uh, the gene delivery system. So in other words, these, are, these T cells are weaponized to kill cancer. They have to be weaponized. You have to give them the weapon. That weapon is delivered through gene therapy. And that gene therapy happens to be a virus, uh, a special kind of virus, not the kind of virus that will infect all people. These are viruses that have been um, purposefully inactivated in order to make them uh, inactive viruses. They can deliver a gene, but they can never go on and infect other cells. They can only go one way. Um, so, so you have to create a facility to make that virus. Um, and also last month in India, we made a facility to make the virus. So for the first time. Um, and so it was a, it was a, it was a double, um, double whammy. There were two trains that were coming at us. Number one is how do we make the virus? The virus itself is very difficult to make. We've now achieved the virus. Um, and how do we make the cells in this vault-like facility? We've made the vault-like facility, and now putting those two pieces together, um, now we're, we're making the cells. We've treated 25 patients. The last piece of this, uh, in order to be fully democratized or fully uh, uh, accessible, is um, is to, to really um, uh, make it, you know, with systems which don't rely on very high consumable prices. Um, and so that, that's one, that's a third piece, that's the third train. Um, so we're now making those two. Um, yeah. So um, one mad idea leads to another, so now I've gone to Bangalore and commissioned someone to make me all the tubing and the piping and the, you know, all the machinery that allows us to do this. Um, and, um, and as I said, we've treated 25 patients. And these are mostly young kids. And they, and this is an important word to use, they are cured. Um, so they're, and obviously, 
uh, inspired by Emily. There's a picture of Emily in the, in the facility. Uh, we always think about her and your group. Um, and in fact, as we speak, someone from Penn is, is in, 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 in India, in yeah. Bangalore. Bruce Levine, your colleague, is in, is in, in, is in India, sort of um, looking at our facility, giving us advice about how to move things along. But um, it was an incredibly generous thing for, for your city to spare um, uh, people so that they could make a difference around the world, and thank you for doing that. Well, thank you for doing it. So, I mean, I can tell you we have about 5,000 cases a year of, you know, pediatric leukemia like Emily had, and I was told there were 60,000 a year in, uh, in India, and they just didn't get treated. So this is huge what SIT's done. Um, and it reminds me of what, you know, so they really, to do the kind of chemotherapy and therapy of uh, childhood leukemia that we did, you know, CAR T cells are one time thing, one and done. You infuse it and it's over uh, and you can go home. But um, for child, what we used to do it took three years. Uh, so when a child was diagnosed, it was three years of chemotherapy, often radiation. So that's awful from the patient's perspective, childhood, growing up, et cetera. But also, you can't do that in India. The logistics just didn't happen. So those 60,000 kids mostly died, whereas in the US, most of them lived. It just it was horrible side effects. So this is doing them. Basically, it's like what happened in Africa, where advances in technology, they never had landline phones in stringing telephone. They went straight to cell phones. And that's what Sid's making happen, uh, you know, there in India, and hopefully in the rest of other. Yeah, I should tell you our roster for. Um, we have a. Uh, I mean, as you you know, we have to go through trials like any other. It's very regulated, um, as I said. There's almost a there's a, an internal monthly inspection, so an internal monthly audit. But there's also random audits that are made for a cell therapy facility. We're talking about cells, so cell therapy facility, and. Um, uh, the, we also have separately a, an open line uh, which allows you from anywhere outside the United States to call in and ask for potential treatment. And if this is now we've extended, actually this week we will begin our trial for multiple myeloma, uh, another deadly cancer. Um, this is an adult cancer. Um, but so we have now lymphoma, myeloma, and leukemia covered. Um, and then now we're beginning some gene therapy studies, all of which can then be done in that cell therapy unit. But um, we put a human being at the end of a line to pick up the phone if you um, were um, asking uh, to be treated uh, and to be put in a, a, a list for the trial. Um, the person gave up after one day. Uh, they said that they were not only there was the job so taxing because the phone rang every second, um, but also it was horrific because it was children from, you can imagine, children from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from, you know, these places are the most populous places in the world, calling every second saying, you know, how can I get, get, get on this, um, get on the next study list, et cetera, et cetera. So finally we've automated it. Um, we have right now a lottery system, which is not great, uh, things being tough. Um, but eventually, hopefully, you know, we will, um, at some point of time, um, we want to return the favor that your city and um, your unit has uh, given to the world. We want to return the favor because, like you said, when you start off with, sometimes when you start off with bad, bad technology and you get really new good technology, you can go over, oops, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, you can go over. Um, and you know, we could at some point of time, I, in my imagination, I could think of a, of a time in which we would say, why, why give kids three years of chemo um, that will cause growth stunting and cognitive retardation and you know, PTSD and psychiatric problems for three full years, imagine being strung up to the hospital. Why give when you can give two shots, maybe one shot, um, and be done? Um, and uh, if that trial proves to be true, um, yeah. then we will return the favor and tell you that it's true, and you can then figure out how to p pressurize um, big pharma companies to make it cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll hand you a hot potato. <laughs>
Yeah, so that's clearly a, a big society issue facing us is how, how to democratize the technology. I can tell you both here in Philadelphia and, and in Bangladesh, Bangladesh and in all throughout India, the whole COVID epidemic made this really difficult and slowed us down. Yes, I mean, yeah. It, and once again, back to, back to Philadelphia. I hope, yeah. you know, with the help of uh, your two recent Nobel laureates, uh, we were able to get through most of that uh, epidemic without the horrendous casualty that could have happened if we didn't yeah. have had a vaccine. So. Yeah. So, you know, I want to go back to the beginning of your book, or one of the stories which I found most um, uh, interesting, really, which, which is a history of discovering how genes begin to work. And I wonder if you can tell us about Gregor Mendel. Yes. Um, um, so Mendel's a, a part of this book, but of course the gene leads up to the cell. Um, and so Mendel was, um, it was a monk. Uh, he was a Moravian monk. Um, and um, I'll tell you a story about Mendel, but let me just tell you a story about, about going to see Mendel. Um, I, uh, it's, Mendel lived in a monast monastery in the city of Bruno. Um, and uh, it's not easy to get to Bruno. Um, it's not terribly difficult, but you have to change two trains, land in Vienna, change trains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the monastery where I wanted to visit um, it, it has no simple mechanism of communication. So you can't write up front and say, I'm coming, you know, can I go and see Mendel's house? So I land up after this exhausting trip uh, all the way. Um, and the woman in the monastery who's sitting at the front desk says, oh, I'm sorry, we're closed. <laughs> um, and it's a weekday. Um, and it's closed because of some God knows what reason. So I said, um, how do I, you know, how does one, I wouldn't know, I, you know, you have no simple mechanism. And I've come here from all this far away just to see the room that Gregor Mendel worked in. Um, and she said, well, you have to present um, an application in triplicate. <laughs> um, so I said, now that, I'm from India, I can solve that problem. I said, I, I hereby present an application in triplicate. And she looked at me, she said, um, okay. So I filled out three forms identically uh, with my name. I filled them out in front of her while she watched very angrily. Um, and then I presented her with three forms and I said, here's the application in triplicate. And she was very annoyed and then she let me in. Um, anyway, so that's how I got into Gregor Mendel's room. Now Gregor Mendel was a monk. Um, and what Mendel discovered was very interesting. What Mendel discovered was that, and he had no idea, he was breeding peas. Um, and uh, what he discovered was that over time, um, when he counted uh, all these seven different uh, uh, in characteristics of peas, uh, traits, um, he found that they um, would travel across generations as if they were intact. So before Mendel, the most logical thing to believe, and sounds more, much more reasonable, um, was that the way that we inherit characteristics from our parents is that the characteristics get put into some kind of biological blender um, and they get blended around um, and thereby, and you get some mixture um, of traits from one parent and the other. Um, what Mendel discovered is that that's not true, um, that there is no such blender, that in fact the traits themselves are coded. He didn't know any of this, word. he didn't know code, he didn't, he didn't know, but what he discovered was that the traits move across generations intact. Um, and that led to the idea many years later, he didn't even coin the word, but years and years later, um, about 45 years later. So for 45 years, basically no one read Mendel's paper. Um, so if you've ever written a paper that no one's ever read, um, <laughs> you can rest assured that maybe in 45 years, someone's actually gonna, might read it and, and be inspired. But anyway, uh, so no one read Mendel's paper, but about 40 odd years later, people suddenly began to realize that that's how the, the, the inheritance parents are uh, work. And it took yet another 40 to 50 odd years before um, scientists figured out that it was DNA that carried that message. And yet another, you know, several years, decades 
to figure out how it carried the message and ultimately how that message gets transmitted to your offspring. Now, just to bring up the story fully, um, the cell has a parallel history. So um, for the longest time, people thought that you know, we were made up, we were slabs of meat. Um, and it was continuous. Um, and that you know, flesh generated flesh, no one knew exactly how, but flesh generated flesh. One very common theory was a theory called the homunculus, that you know, human beings were born fully formed and then we sort of got blown up like a balloon gets blown up um, <laughs> over time. Um, but cell theory is very analogous in some ways, that all of a sudden you realize that, that the world, in the case of inheritance, is the word used in this book, is atomistic, in the sense it's all divided up. It's not one single spool. It's all divided up, and it's, in the case of genes, genes, uh, divided up. Um, and similarly, in the, in the cellular world, you realize that we aren't slabs of meat. Um, we aren't slabs of flesh. It's not continuous. It comes from one cell, one cell becomes two cells, et cetera, et cetera. And if you were to look down a microscope in, through the human body, then of course you'd realize that we were not made up of con continuous slabs of meat, but in fact we're made up of individual cells. Um, your skin has uh, billions of individual cells. Your brain has billions of individual cells and so forth. So, it's so, um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of a deep analogy, I would say, between these ideas. Um, and, um, and it leads to a set of, I think, very interesting philosophical questions, which is why is it that matter is organized atomistically, atoms, um, cells, bodies are organized atomist at atomistically, information is organized atomistically um, in genes, information for the computer is uh, organized atomistically in bits and bytes, um, and you know what, what the advantages of that system are. So um, it's a very interesting philosophical question that, that why these atomistic ideas um, become so powerful. One obvious answer is that you can you can build with building blocks uh, much more easily than you can build without building blocks. It's much more difficult to take, as I said, a whole homunculus and blow it up. But maybe there's some other reason that we don't fully understand yet. Um, I'm reminded of this um, important moment because it's a philosophically important moment because in the world of computers, um, we are beginning to build, um, although we haven't succeeded yet, but we're beginning to build non-atomistic computers. So people have heard about quantum computing a little bit. So, Quantum computing, uh, or quantum computing in general, uh, does not rely on bits and bytes. Uh, it, it relies on other systems. I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, in the world of cells, it'd be an interesting philosophical question, and in the world of genes, it'd be an interesting philosophical question to figure out how we could move away from these atomistic <laughs> ideas um, into something more probabilistic than less atomistic, and, and what that would do. But um, I'll leave that kind of an, as an open, and I don't know the answer, but I, I love these kinds of um, puzzles, because what, what would we start looking like if we started having, let's say, some kind of hybrid cell? Um, we've actually started making some. Uh, we've made a, a completely new, a neo cell, um, a cell that's never been found, it's not, it's not found in nature. We, you, uh, you and I have discussed this before. Um, in fact, we put them into human beings. Um, uh, to treat cancer, but, and, um, and so far they've lived. They live as neo-cells, neo, completely neo-cells. Of course, a CAR-T cell is a somewhat of a completely yeah. neo-cell. So. You know, I think we have time just for one more question, and then we're going to have, uh, you know, uh, time for audience question and answer. So, um, you know, I wonder if you might talk about, you know, this, the new aspect now of cells of, of um, you know, we, when I was in medical school and would said, you know, we were taught Cells Not at the same time. Yeah, but <laughs> close. But anyway, but that cells progressively differentiate and they age, and that you can't reverse time. Um, and there's been a revolution now where uh, of now making stem cells out of mature cells. And I wonder if you might describe a little bit about pluripotent stem cells. Sure. Um, it, people thought that this was complete madness, um, and. 
again, this was one of these Im completely impractical, improbable ideas um, taken up by a Japanese scientist, Shinya Yamanaka, who also won the Nobel Prize um, several years ago. But Yamanaka launched this, um, there, were, there were sort of very vague hints um, from various people that this could be done, that you, had to, you could take a cell and reverse its time in terms of aging. So you could take a mature cell and make it a pluripotent cell. And by a pluripotent cell, it means that that cell can give rise to, so you take a skin cell, which is completely committed, it is completely fixed to being a skin cell, and you can take that skin cell and reverse time and make it into a cell that can become skin and cartilage and bone and neurons and all of these other kinds of cells. In fact, in principle, we know in animals, it can become a full animal. Um, so you've converted a fully mature cell into uh, a cell that has all these capabilities. Um, there were some hints that it could be done. Uh, the work that had been done earlier suggested that there, were, there was a possibility that, it, that you could do this. Um, and um, Yamanaka uh, did this improbable thing is that he, he imagined that there were a combination of genes that would be able to do this. He knew that unlikely to be one gene. And so he began to test combinations, but in hundreds of, com hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of combinations of genes, because not, not one would do. So imagine that you have, you know, 10 genes in one column, 10 genes in the second column, 10 genes in the third, and 10. Already now you can, th you can imagine that you have, you know, more than 100,000 combinations that you can possibly, or permutations, that you can possibly have of those, of picking from column one, two, three, and four. Um, but he did, did this and eventually found four. Um, and now, you know, there are some chemicals that can even replace some of them. So we're entering a, an era where you could take um, a skin cell, um, and I know you've been working on this yourself, uh, you can take a skin cell or some other cell, some mature cell, and make it into a T cell, and then make that T cell into a CAR T cell. So you can essentially create an immune system, or part of an immune system, out of a skin cell, and you no longer have to wait for um, you know, those cells to become what they become. You can, in fact, grow these cells and put them in a bank, and if you would, were to ever need CAR T cells or T cells, you could grow them up and they would become CAR T cells and T cells. So uh, an incredible revolution. We come to that towards the end of the book, but, um, but that's, the, that's the incredible capacity that, that, um, that, and very, very surprising, certainly. No one had imagined that any of that could be done. Yeah, completely true. I mean, you know, the first cell therapies were things like blood transfusion, um, which came out in World War II. Just in that, I mean, saved many lives just to be able to type blood. But now, what you just heard from Sid is a revolution that if you can make and regenerate different kinds of cells, uh, that's the future we have coming forward, I think, with cell therapy. Yeah, so, I, 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 let me just, before we end up with the uh, audience, I'm just going to just put one last thought in in people's uh, brains, which I think is, is, is very important, um, is that we're sitting on top of three revolutions. And it may not occur to you scientifically. It may not occur to you, but these are generational changing revolutions. And we're seeing them right now. You know, the problem is when you look at things so close up, they don't seem as if they're so, such a big change. Um, <laughs> Number one is artificial intelligence. Um, uh, the, the stuff that you see about artificial intelligence, you know, the kind of chat GPT stuff, that's just nothing. That's tiddlywinks compared to the, the real depth of things you can do, make new kinds of medicines, make new kinds of materials, make new kinds of various things. Um, we can talk about the problems, um, uh, which are the existential threats that that causes as well. Happy to answer that question. Number two is um, a cellular revolution. So we're now making new kinds of cells. We can bank them. Um, we can, uh, via the cellular revolution, we can make, we can basically absorb the benefits of the genetic revolution. So they're sort of two things combining together. So to, to give one example, IVF is an example of, of the cellular revolution. So close by that we don't think of it that way, but of course it is. It's a 
it's a cellular product. Uh, human beings are cellular products. And the third one, of course, is we're sort of in the middle of is the information revolution. So um, what's most interesting, and I'll leave this as the last sort of thought question, is when these three things come together. Um, and the, both the benefits and the existential threats that that can bring. And I think that is an interesting note to end on because you, know, you can go home and stay awake all night thinking about, <laughs> about what will happen when these three things come together. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I just want to thank both of you for your contributions as well as coming out here tonight. Thank you so much. Um, the question I have for you guys is uh, relative to the last topic that you were talking about, about um, cells. Um, I, I've, I think everybody has heard about the Henrietta Lacks cells. Um, and you were talking about age, the cells age. Uh, but hers don't seem to. Is there, does, is there some type of uh, explanation for that? Well, cancer cells, well, the, hers are cancer cells. So they were, they were cells taken from uh, Henrietta Lacks um, uh, cancer. Cancer cells seem to defy the standard processes of aging. Even cancer cells age, um, and cancer cells die. The problem is that they, is that they reproduce, um, and those, it's not that, again, remember that cancer cells also die like, like normal cells die. The problem is that they reproduce uh, so much that the death is never, com ever com the death of that cell or that cell lineage is never completed. So they keep reproducing and reproducing. A normal cell will have a finite number of reproductions before it becomes tired and says, I'm done, I'm becoming a, um, you know, I'm either dying or I'm going to become a mature cell and sit tight, for instance, in your brain for a long time, period of time. That's the normal process. And there's a mechanism by which that happens. Um, and over time, the, the genetic programs of a, of a cell gets locked and more and more locked and more and more locked, ultimately leading to a, a normal cell becoming either dead or uh, becoming a mature cell and sitting tight. In cancer, that does not happen, and that's what doesn't happen in Henrietta Lacks cells. So people often say cancer cells are immortal. They're not immortal in the sense that, they, in the sense that you might understand it colloquially. They also die. The problem is that they don't have a program to stop reproducing. Um, so that's the fundamental difference. It's not cell death, although there's some cancers that involve cell death, a few, but it's not the question of cell death, it's our lack of cell death. Cancer cells die very much. The problem with cancer cells is, is the, the capacity to not be able to stop reproducing and not be able to reach that state in which they get locked and say, I'm done. Yeah, the, um, to just say a little bit more about that, um, uh, normal cells have a clock in them, and they count every time they divide. And actually, DNA shortens. The end of the DNA, the tails, is one way of knowing how many times a cell's divided. And, and that's been worked out in human terms to really last us a lifespan, but not, we couldn't go and have another one of us be cloned without lengthening in your DNA the ends of that again. And Leonard Hayflick here in, in Philadelphia described that, called the Hayflick phenomenon, that you can only divide so many times unless you get immortalized. And that's what happened to Henry Adelax cancer cells. They could always reproduce. Um, you're talking about neo cells. Um, what is a neo cell exactly? I mean, how, how is it different from, you know, the cells in your body? It's, you said it's made in a lab. Um, yes. And okay, so so why did you do it? What's the function? And does it does it work? Does it work like your your all your cells? It divides. It has the same chemistry. It has the same cell bodies and you yes. know mechanisms and whatnot. So um, there are many there are many different ways you can approach making a neo cell. Um, I, I'm we're using them. We're using a very primitive, uh, or I would say the first generation of them. So what we're creating is we're taking cells and making them have hybrid properties. And why did we do that? We did that because for solid tumors, um, these uh, lung cancer, breast cancer, et cetera, 
these CAR T cells, which seem so effective in blood cancers, don't seem to work very well in solid cancers. Um, and we really fully don't understand why. Carl's described a few of the phenomenon why, but uh, we don't fully understand exactly why. One of the most horrific images that I've ever seen, and uh, Carl's published on this, is you take a solid tumor in an animal model, or even in a human, and you take CAR T cells, and you'll see the T cells form a ring around the, the solid tumor, but they can't get in. And whether that's, uh, we know some, some reasons why. It's a physical barrier, it's a chemical barrier, there, there, are, there are active factors that the tumor is secreting to prevent T cells from getting in, but that's what the problem is. So, but there is another cell uh, that actually gets in very well, um, and it's a myeloid cell. We back to our, my favorite myeloid cell. <laughs> uh, these are cells that are professionals. Their, 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 their job is to scout. Um, so right now, in your body, these cells are scouting around, um, looking, for, um, looking for pathogens and making sure that, they don't, that you don't have pathogens, and they can get into tumors very well. Um, so the reason we made them, we said, well, what if we take a myeloid cell and we, we convert it into, uh, and give it the apparatus of a T cell? So we mix, we create a hybrid cell, which is ha half a myeloid cell and then half a T cell, so that it would go into a tumor and then kill like a T cell would kill. So that was the reason behind this, as we've treated some patients and we're waiting for some data to figure out whether it works or doesn't work, but at least it gets in and, and stays. But that's just the primitive, as I said, that's step one. Um, you can do much more complicated things. There are people who are working on synthetic biology much more deeply than this. Uh, this would be one example of synthetic biology. But people, there, there, there are people who are making cells um, by taking um, a cell, uh, hollowing it out in terms of pulling out all its genetic material and replacing it with uh, a new genetic code, a new genetic material. That is also a new cell. What we haven't been able to do so far, and by the way, that cell reproduces, reproduces its genetic material and behaves like a normal cell. What we haven't been able to do so far, which would be wonderful to do at some point in time because it would give us enormous power, is to build a complete cell from scratch. That we have not been able to do. That would involve building each of the organelles, the anatomy, the parts of a cellular anatomy from scratch. I suspect we'll be able to do it at some point in time, um, but it would involve building mitochondria from scratch. It would involve building the, you know, the various cell parts of the cell body, the nucleus from scratch, et cetera, et cetera. That we have not been able to do. No one's been able to do. So. Yeah, to put a little context, um, we right now just have this year the 50th anniversary of where recombinant biology and molecular biology started, where you could actually take the part of a gene, take it out of one, say, a bacteria, put it in a virus, and the other way around, change it in cells. That's what Sid's talking about. So 50 years ago, the very first ability to do that happened. And so you can make new kinds of cells. Um, we learned about during COVID, the so-called gain of function research, you know, where you hear a lot of talk about people intentionally engineering viruses to be either more virulent or not. I mean, we've used viruses that have been the pathogenicity has been taken out of them so they could be used as a tool. But you can have a form of biologic warfare where you use the same technology to make, you know, worse agents, either viruses or bacteria. So there's an issue here on uh, ethics um, and how you control science this way, that, you know, which is something that we need to have harmonization on between uh, different countries and, and that, that has evolved now because these tools have become, literally sometimes high school students can do this in their garage. As somebody who's a practitioner and very familiar with impractical ideas, I want to thank you on all our behalf that your impractical ideas have become so practical and so life affirming. And I have a question that has nothing to do with cells. I was an English major. <laughs> I'm interested in, if you wouldn't mind, telling us a little bit about your growing up in India and when, as a child or as a young adult or a young man, you started to have thoughts like this. And a little bit about your family. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up uh, in India and I, I, I came quite quickly to um, uh, uh, university at, uh, at, at Stanford. Um, 
I, um, uh, what, one thing that people don't know about me is for m my entire childhood, I thought I would be a musician. Um, and I learned music very, very, very um, deeply. Um, and very few people know about this. But, um, so I, that was what I was going to do. Um, and I, I think, and if I may answer your question a little bit metaphorically, I think um, it is not a coincidence that a lot of scientists are musicians. Um, and in general, it's not a coincidence that a lot of mathematicians, a lot of biologists, a lot of actually the, a, a, a vast number of creative people, if they don't know music, they'll at least understand why music is important. Um, and I'll tell you why, I think. Um, because it allows you, and it asks you, music allows you or asks you, to make something out of nothing. Um, so you take sound, which you and I are making right now, and all of a sudden you're asked to say, take that sound and make something completely different out of it. Um, and especially uh, if you're interested in jazz or composition too, it doesn't matter. You're asked to make something completely different out of something, something else. So I, a lot of what I do, and again, I don't speak very publicly about it, but a lot of what I do I think goes back to that, I, that idea. So I went to Stanford, and the first thing I discovered is I went and started working. I was, you know, I was interested in music still, but I thought, you know, let me, I'm sort of vaguely interested in biology. I was good at science. Um, and so I went to work for Paul Berg uh, at, at Paul Berg's lab. And Paul Berg happened to be the person who had in, invented recombinant DNA. So, so this was what you could do. You can still do. You can go to Penn and say, I'm going to go work for Carl Jung. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> recruiting people to your laboratory. Thank but anyway, you. um, so you can do things like this. Um, and so I went to work for Paul's lab, at Paul's lab. And I got two things out of this. Number one is I learned that just like in music, you can make something out of nothing uh, or something out of something else. You can do that in science. Um, Paul, by the way, loved music, was very interested in music. And the second thing is that Paul, once he had made this incredible discovery that you can take two pieces of genes and make a neo gene, a completely new genetic material, he had organized uh, the, the most important ethics conference in the history of biology, called the Asilomar Conference. Um, and so from him, I also learned the fact that uh, along with biology, you also have to have training or some kind of idea of the effects that you're producing in the world. And the way to do that is to engage with the world through ethical dialogue, the books or whatever it might be, so that that dialogue doesn't get interrupted. You, you're not sort of this, uh, person in a white coat, um, but in fact uh, having engagement with the world. So I hope that's some answer to your lovely question. Hi. Um, my quick question is, um, you mentioned some of the revolutions in medicine, and one of them is AI, and I was wondering if um, any of your therapies that you're working on incorporate AI <laughs> or anything like of that nature. Um, so the quick answer is yes. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I've started some new work, um, another totally impractical idea. But the impractical idea was, I was talking, just talking to Carl about it beforehand, is I thought to myself, if we can do all of this fun stuff with AI, why can't we use AI to make medicines? Um, because uh, AI can test all of that. So, um, and in fact, why can't we use AI to make the beginnings of a, a CAR T cell? So the new thing that I'm doing right now, I, just, I was showing Carl my, my latest pictures. I, I send them to Carl occasionally, they're like baby pictures. But, um, but we've just begun to design um, the, the beginnings of a CAR T cell based on AI alone. Um, and that will, I think, be something that's um, really gonna be super interesting for me. Um, maybe it'll never work out. Completely impractical idea, but something to look forward to. Thank you very much.